They're just such beautiful fish. That flannel mouth sucker with that big golden yellow belly and the blue head with those just chisel-like scraping ridges in its mouth and round tail chubs when they're in spawning condition, just a bright red stripe along their whole lateral line. And uh, they're just so neat. They're, just, they're beautiful. They need to be respected for just the beauty they bring to our world. Um, even though I know most people uh, recoil at a ventral mouth, <laughs> we ought to learn to do better. It's important to look at these fish as artwork, really kind of evolutionary art arriving in their present form after millions of years of being isolated in this space and going through giant geologic changes and changes in climate, floods and droughts. They're really resilient. And I think that if people just work to understand them a little bit, it's really kind of hard to deny their beauty and inherent right to exist. They don't exist anywhere else on this planet. These fish exist in seven states in the United States of America, and that's it, and they're so unique. Three species collectively are flannel mouth sucker, blue head sucker, round tail chub. All three of them are endemic to the Colorado River Basin. They're sort of the leftover large body species that after the Colorado pike minnow, the razorback sucker, the bony tail, the humpback chub, after they became lifted, there are still these leftover species, and that's why they were called the three species. So while these populations they were still in decline, but they were relatively stable compared to those more endangered fish species. Um, two of them obviously are suckers, and so they have the subterminal mouth or the fully ventral mouth and, and make their living off of cleaning things off the bottom of the streams. Or in the case of bluehead suckers, they have those scraping ridges inside their mouth that they use to scrape diatoms and whatnot off the rocks. Um, round tail chubs are more of a invertebrate, maybe slash fish eater. Uh, almost trout-like, like a, a native uh, de desert river sort of trout, low elevation, and make their living on preying on small items, much like a trout would. So I grew up um, in southwest Colorado in a rural town and in a really avid hunting and fishing family. So certainly that's what got me kind of into conservation to begin with is primarily fishing for non-native fish, things like rainbow trout and brown trout, brook trout, bass and, and walleye, all those things that people know a lot about and we have a really great a wealth of opportunity here in Colorado. And so if we were out fishing on the San Juan River and we caught a sucker, you know, it was suggested that that fish was somehow damaging because it eats trout eggs and it's ugly and really has no role and that really that we'd be better off without them. Ironically, fast forward about 20 years, and many of those fish that we were kind of disrespecting are the species that I'm trying to protect. They're not listed as endangered or threatened, and so there just doesn't seem to be a lot of strong emotions tied to them. People don't feel like whatever happens to the fish are gonna impact them. Because they're not endangered, they don't have federal statutes that tell us how we're going to manage them. So the goal is to really get a lot of cooperation from people who have investment in the water, whether that's landowners or the general public for using for recreation, for fishing, for water for municipalities and that sort of thing. At this point, it's an adaptive management plan where we're trying to get people to recognize that there's opportunities to protect these fish without having to alter their way of life and by working together to kind of get to that point. It's really important to understand just how harsh the environments that they live in are. The Colorado River Basin is mostly snowmelt driven systems so we have really big floods in the spring and then that can basically turn into low water, really warm conditions later in the summer and fall but then big rain events that cause high magnitude floods again so these fish are well adapted to a variety of really intense conditions. The threats they face primarily have to do with water diversion and damming, uh, our use of it as irrigation water and our bisecting rivers with large dams preclude their moving about as they once did. They're all known as fairly migratory in parts of their life history anyway.
The second category of threats that these species face is the introduction of non-native species. And there have been over 60 species that introduced into the Colorado River Basin. And they cause a variety of problems. First, predation. We have a lot of predators in the system that didn't used to be there. Things like smallmouth bass and northern pike have really high consumptive rates and can put a hurt on our native fish, and they do. Secondly, just competition. Even fish that seemingly are benign, like little shiners, they can compete with various life stages of our native fish. And lastly, hybridization. So this, this is really important for our two native suckers, the flannel mouth sucker and the bluehead sucker. We have non-native suckers that were inadvertently introduced into the Colorado River Basin. These are white suckers and long nose suckers. And uh, these species can readily hybridize with the native ones and really pollute their genetic integrity and threaten their existence. So there are a number of tools that we have in our box for managing the species and one of the most common ways that we capture the fish is through a technique that's called electrofishing. And this comes in a, cu a couple different varieties depending on the situation. Sometimes we do this from a raft um, in big rivers, but it can also be um, with a barge and a generator with uh, a team going up upstream uh, with, with electrodes. So there's a few different ways that we do it. But the point is that this puts a pulse of electricity into the water and temporarily stuns fish, does not kill them, but enables us to capture them and, and take data on some of the key population parameters, look at abundance through time, and species composition. So this is a really powerful way to uh, survey a fishery. So one of the common things we do with three species is we, we give them a tag. And the most common kind of tag that we use is called a PIT tag, which stands for Passive Integrated Transponder. And this technology is the exact same as the technology that your vet uses when they give your dog or cat a chip. It's essentially a unique barcode for each individual fish. And this is really useful because all three species are known to move quite far distances. So if we catch a fish, we can, a fish that is tagged, we can find out when when it was tagged, where it was tagged, how much it's grown. Uh, it just it provides a lot of information. So it's just a small capsule given to each fish. And along with the antennas that we place in rivers, we can really see how these fish move because when they swim across and encounter an antenna, it is red and we can tell when that individual fish crossed a certain point in the river, a certain, certain uh, location. When we look at this data and really tease it out, we can start to see some of the major patterns. And uh, this really helps just in general with managing these fish, protecting priority habitats and understanding when, when they move and where they move. So some really spectacular examples or stories of long range movements come out of this pit tagging technology that we use. Uh, one really awesome example that I always reference when I tell people about uh, these fish is a flannel mouse sucker that was tagged in 2011 in the Green River in Utah. And it traveled down the Green, into the, down to the Colorado Confluence, up the Colorado River, and then up the Dolores River, all the way up to our Disappointment Creek pit tag antenna, and showed up there in 2014, and that's 264 miles. We then know that it swam back down to the Colorado River Confluence at some point, because it showed up March 2016 at the confluence again, and went all the way back up to that disappointment array again, which is 120 miles. So we know this fish traveled at least 500 miles, but probably much more than that. So it just goes to show just how much space these fish need to complete their life history. And, and without this tag, we would never know that. So with respect to Rubidoux Creek, we believe that it's a, it's a really important spawning tributary for at least the native suckers and probably for the mountain tail chubs as well. We've done trapping operations on Rubidoux Creek in years past in an intermittent tributary to this stream where we handled up to eight or 10,000 fish over a period of about six weeks. In the case of the intermittent stream, it's dry eight months of the year, so they come in these huge waves to use it for spawning in the spring. This is called a resistance board weir. So these are 20 feet long, fish will swim under it, they meet the bulkhead or the anchoring point uh, to the stream there and can't find their way through 
until they get to this location, which is our entrance chute that goes into our trap box. So fish have free access from here to the fike in that trap box, which of course is pinched off so that fish can easily find their way in, not so easily find their way out. So that'll collect all the fish that swim through this location. The reason we're setting up this weir again this year is because we want to preclude entry by all non-natives and hybrid fishes. Therefore, the assumption would be that once these other fish get upstream, everybody, every fish that's participating in the spawn that year would be a native fish. All the larvae that are produced in this entire tributary network that year would be native larvae, thus benefiting eventually as they recruit to the Gunnison River, they'd benefit the main stem uh, population both you know, during their time and, and then hopefully in future generations as well. Particularly if we demonstrate that this is a successful mechanism to prevent that hybridization phenomenon and thus giving a boost to those native populations, hoping to keep them around for future generations. So I think as Coloradoans, we really all have a love for the rugged landscapes, the wild places that we still have, and the great ecological diversity of our state. This is especially true for our aquatic ecosystems, which are the lifeblood of the arid landscape that we all live in. Those are places that we gather with family and friends and recreate and think and pray, and they're important to many, many of us from all different walks of life. And I think just out of principle, we all have a responsibility for conserving the species that make this state great and keeping a part of our natural legacy intact moving forward. That's the game, isn't it? Trying to find the balance between stewarding the earth and using what is here on the earth, um, leaving things for future generations. So I, that's what I want to be. So I want to be a steward of the natural resources. To me, then it just stands to reason that we should be protecting every little piece, every building block of the ecosystem. No matter how small or seemingly insignificant they are, it's all part of that system. And really, Aldo Leopold said it best again here. He said, to keep every cog and wheel is the first precaution of intelligent tinkering. And uh, we use that sort of as a guiding light for what we do um, at Colorado Parks and Wildlife. And uh, that definitely provides some inspiration for what I do every day, keeps me going, and uh, helps me keep fighting the good fight to make sure that these, these species that maybe traditionally weren't paid attention to persist well into the future. It's just exponentially easier to protect what we already have than to try to replace it. And my perspective is that being proactive is going to make a big difference for these three species compared to what we did with the four endangered fish species which was being reactive. We didn't have programs in place to try to protect them before it was too late. And so we have the opportunity now. I think it's important to recognize that the action that we do now can really make that difference in protecting a species rather than waiting until it's too late. I would just encourage folks who are out there fishing, particularly, you know, if they catch a sucker or a chub, they ought to look carefully at it and just take time to appreciate the uniqueness of that fish and maybe consider putting it back in the stream rather than putting it out on the bank. They aren't consuming everything that the trout need. They aren't consuming everything that other game fish need. They're just fulfilling their role and they do have a place. It'd be great to see our anglers respect those other fishes that aren't necessarily the ones meant for the table or the ones that are meant for the picture book or the trophy wall.